Good morning, everyone. I see the screen filling up and um, people are still coming in. We're just a few minutes past 930, um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome you to our neighborhood exchange breakfast. I'm Anna Edwards. I'm the Vice President of Corporate Engagement at United Way of Metro Chicago. And um, before we introduce the panel, I want to do a couple of quick housekeeping things and encourage you to mute yourself. Um, so that the um, any background noise doesn't automatically put you on screen. Um, and I also want to encourage you to utilize the chat function in Zoom for questions that you have as the panelists are speaking or when we actually turn to the Q&A portion of our program because um, we will be moderating the, the questions based on what you guys submit through chat. And so if you get an idea as people are talking, go ahead and, and put it into the, the chat on Zoom. Um, our topic today in, in the neighborhood exchange, I should probably say right up top, is the intent behind these gatherings is for um, all of us to connect with each other and with community. And this is our first virtual one. And I think um, there are people who are at all different phases on the spectrum. Some are Zoomed out and some are eager to maintain this connection. And so um, we are excited to, to give it a go virtually, like a lot of us have been doing in this, this new, uh, new world order. Um, today, our topic is innovation and adaptation in the times of crisis. And we're gonna talk about local responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're gonna look at it from a couple of different angles, both as individuals and organizations. And as organizations, we're talking about companies as well as nonprofits. Um, We've all had to adapt to the present moment and many have risen and tried new things and, and really um, started working in, in transformative ways. The, um, the goal here is to meet our community's greatest needs and we've changed operations to do that. And so as we now move from a crisis response to a long-term recovery, leaders are really trying to figure out how to maintain um, a, a really agile and innovative response. And so we've got great speakers who are with us today to, um, to share their experience. And so now I wanna turn it over to the panelists. And when um, I call on you to introduce yourself, I wanna encourage you, we all can see your bios and uh, a lot of us already know your organization. So when you, um, when you introduce yourself, you can tell us what you do at your organization, but I'd also like you to, to tell us what makes you proud to be a Chicagoan right now and what, what makes you feel good about calling Chicago home. So why don't we get started um, uh, with Emma Asante and um, she's with uh, NBC Chicago and Telemundo, but tell us, uh, tell us what you do there and, and what makes you proud of Chicago. Sure, first of all, thank you for having me. Good morning to everyone. My name is Emma Asante and I am the Vice President of Special Projects and Community Relations over at NBC5 in Telemundo, Chicago. And uh, I basically oversee all of our community outreach for both stations and uh, any of our, our large scale broadcast events. Um, what makes me proudest right now to be a Chicagoan is, is quite honestly how we're all coming together during this difficult time. Um, it, it just makes me, it makes me feel good that we have each other to help through this. Great. Uh, next, I want to turn to Mark Ishaw. He's the CEO at Thresholds. Why don't you tell us uh, what you do there and, and what makes you proud to be a Chicagoan? Uh, thank you. And uh, thanks so much for having me too with these esteemed speakers, uh, my new friends. Uh, Mark Ishaw, CEO of Thresholds. Uh, Thresholds is a large community behavioral health organization. We provide mental health care, health care, primary care with our partners uh, and housing for about 10,000 people in the greater Chicago area. And I've been with the organization uh, for the past eight years. Um, I'm a lifelong Chicago and I was born and bred on the Southwest side in a neighborhood called Marquette Park. Uh, and now I live in the Western suburbs, but uh, Chicago has been my home for 57 years and I, um, I love it. And I'm so, so proud of Chicago, uh, always have been, uh, despite our many challenges. I'm so proud of the millions of people uh, who have stepped up uh, in the last couple months, uh, individuals who have just helped us flatten the curve and save lives, uh, who are giving and caring and sharing. Uh, I am so proud of the powerful institutions, the public and private sector, who 
uh, are reimagining uh, their power uh, and how they're making decisions to uh, support all of us as we move forward. And finally, and the third thing that I'm really proud of is that we are, um, we're confronting privilege uh, now in a way that we've never done, uh, including white privilege and how we're gonna use this moment uh, to help create a new normal, uh, not go back to an old normal. So yeah, I'm incredibly proud. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Todd, we're gonna turn to you next. Um, Todd Osman is the CEO, of, uh, president, I'm sorry, of Goose Island Beer Company. Um, why don't you um, introduce yourself? Sure, so thanks for having me. Uh, that's always a difficult question to answer. What does a president of a beer company do? <laughs> I get to ask that all the time, but uh, essentially we, you know, I make sure we're making beer and um, being a good community member. It's part of our DNA and, and what this company was founded on. Um, but my sister and I, born, born in, born in uh, Lincoln Park, you know, what, what does Chicago mean to me right now and how am I proud of it? My mother, Grew up in the Austin neighborhood in a house with her aunts and uncles and cousins. My father grew up in Lakeview, one of uh, seven siblings, uh, multi-generational family in one house. And my wife is one of seven siblings from the south side of Chicago. Uh, so I literally can't go anywhere in the city without running into a family member. Um, you know, but now uh, Chicago is starting to feel like one big family to me. First, with the COVID-19 response, I think we really did a wonderful job of caring about our neighbors, friends and family and, and social distanced and stay at home. Um, you know, really, really proud of the response to that. And then lately with the, uh, with the social movement, the, the needed, uh, you know, protests that we've had, I think, uh, again, Chicago has come together uh, pretty quickly uh, for, for one, one movement. So I'm proud of how I've always called Chicago family. Now I truly feel like it's a much bigger family. Great. Thanks, Todd. Um, let me go ahead and, and read the and talk about this first question, but I want to give each of the panelists an opportunity to respond to this because we know that you all represent organizations that have adapted in, in specific ways to better serve the needs of our neighbors. I'd like you, if you could please, to, to tell us a little bit about how your organization specifically has managed to meet the moment that we're in. Why don't we go ahead and start with Emma. You know, so uh, being in the media business and, and, and right now, of course, there's a lot of, there's a lot of focus on uh, our product. Uh, NBC5 and, and Telemundo Chicago. And it's, it's been a difficult time for, for all of us because all of us, in, 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 we're, all, we're all community members. We live here as well. I would say that, you know, how we've changed or not, not even changed, just continued and deepened our resolve would be with our Making a Difference efforts. So Making a Difference is our campaign, our initiative that we've had for oh, six, seven years now where we're really focused on providing solutions to the problems that our viewers face and and not and and this is an opportunity where we definitely have focused on that and part of it comes through the partnerships that we have um it's been really critical the partnerships in the community that we already had built through our making a difference um reach outs um they were there and listening to our community has been very important one of the parts of making a difference that is pretty much off camera and not it's not really widespread is our community action boards um, we have community action boards, and these are board members, people in the community that we meet with on a regular basis, that we can have frank discussions with them to talk to us about what is happening in the different sectors, whatever they represent. And we have city and suburbs and, and a good mix of, of some wonderful leaders that kind of have the ear to the ground, and, and we can just have those discussions. And so we've leaned on that to tell us what is it that we're missing? What is it that we need to do more of? What are we doing great with? What are we not doing so great with? And those partnerships are critical for us right now as, as we come together. Another thing that, we, um, that we've done is um, also leaned on our community, uh, the faith community as well, listening to the faith community who really have been wonderful and letting us know what the, the concerns of the community have been so we can then address them in our different newscasts. Emma, thanks. Um, Todd, why don't you go ahead and and take this and talk, talk to us about Goose Island's response. Sure, so we, we have recognized it as a, an important issue. And, uh, you know, we, we put out for the world to see, uh, to hold ourselves accountable that we're gonna, we're gonna make change within. 
uh, but we also have an opportunity to be leaders within the, the craft beer community, um, both from, from drinkers and from the business point of view. So we, we made an immediate commitment, short-term commitment, medium-term commitment, and, and long-term commitments. Um, you know, the immediate commitment we could make, we made a, a donation to, to my block, my, my hood, my city. Um, you know, and, and short term, we have the opportunity to support black owned businesses uh, in the raw materials that we source, whether it's for food for our pub or uh, the materials we use to, to make the beer at our, our brewery. Um, you know, and then medium term, this I think this is an important one. We're able to, to, to do a better job of recruiting and diversifying. Um, and, you know, for, for whatever reason, I, I think Goose Island's voice, and I think it's because of all the community efforts we've done in the past, is much bigger than the actual size of, of the business. So we're hoping to lead by example uh, and, you know, really start within and, and lead a movement within our, our craft beer community. And then long term, we're, we're uh, supporting efforts to educate and, um, and support voting. So we, we want people to get out and vote, but we're doing our part. We recognize that, that we can, we have an opportunity to be leaders. Good point. I like, I like thinking about internally and externally the way you are. That's helpful, Todd. Um, Mark, talk to us about thresholds and the organizational response that, that you've been leading. Sure. I think the first, I'm going to first respond to our, res, uh, our response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is that okay, Anna? And then yes. come back, come back in the next uh, few minutes to our response to uh, the the challenge that we're facing with overall systemic injustice. Is that okay? Absolutely. That, that's that's, that's where we're going to go next. So that's perfect. Okay. So I'm going to start with the COVID response. Um, so you know, for 60 years, Thresholds has provided housing and health care and mental health care uh, to the most vulnerable people in Chicagoland, people with serious and persistent mental illness. Uh, who would otherwise be institutionalized, uh, institutionalized on the streets uh, as homeless, institutionalized in jails, using the ER as primary care, and of course the institution of uh, nursing homes, uh, where more people in Illinois are institutionalized than in any other state, and maybe even all the other states combined. Uh, so our focus has always been to make sure that people with serious mental illnesses can be uh, living integrated lives, fully independent lives in the community. Uh, and we're really high touch, right? So we have 700 social workers that are on the streets uh, at any one time, uh, serving people who are homeless, going to the jails, going to nursing homes, going to people's houses, going to coffee shops uh, to help them on their road to recovery in a high touch individual way, uh, helping them get jobs, helping them get through school and finish school, uh, get it reconnected with family, et cetera. So when COVID hit, uh, you can only imagine, one, we were scared to death uh, that because we serve such a highly vulnerable population that they were going to be the most at risk for COVID deaths. So I'm gonna start at the end and then go back a little bit. Uh, 64 people of the 10,000 people that we served last year contracted COVID, 64. At 64 too many people, but 64 out of the 10,000 we serve, three so sadly have died. And they died in nursing homes where more than half of the people dying of COVID in Illinois are dying. 31 of our staff people, of our 1,200 staff people have contracted COVID and every single one of them, uh, thank God and knock on wood, has fully recovered. Uh, so, so we're doing something right. Uh, yet we had to make a major pivot in mid-March from our hands-on, high-touch work. Uh, to We had to close down our drop-in centers. We had to close our kitchens. We had to close every place where people congregate. But we kept every single residence, all 40 of our residences open 24-7. Uh, we kept all of our caseworkers, every single one of them working, uh, mostly working telephonically. Uh, but making sure that we were able to communicate digitally uh, with as many of our folks as possible. So there's been sort of major clinical shift in how we're doing the work that we do. Uh, you know, at the same time, we've had to reimagine our advocacy work uh, and push the state and the city uh, to think about how to pay us in different ways. We've had to reinvent our fundraising work. 
Um, and mostly we've been focused uh, sort of so clearly on our staff to make sure that they are safe and secure and feel empowered to do the work that they do. So it's been a major shift. And as we move forward, uh, we have to bring back all that is fantastic about our model and include all the new stuff that we never did before. Mark, thank you. You, you kind of um, eat up this next question really well, so I'll probably ask you to, to continue your, your thought on it because I, I sense that the, the answer to the response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the, the more recent events in the last couple of weeks are, are tied for you. So um, we would be remiss if in this discussion we didn't um, address the current moment and how the community response to the death of George Floyd has changed your work. And so Mark, do you wanna go with that? Um, Cause I, I think that's where you were headed. Um, yeah. Thank you. To yeah. the first question. So we'll let you keep going and then we'll turn to, to Todd and then Emma. Yeah, well, I took up a lot of oxygen on the last question, so I'll, I'll try to be a little briefer. Um, yeah, I mean, the last couple of weeks have been devastating. Um, more than half of the people that we serve at Thresholds are African-American. More About half of our staff are African-American. Um, and so the events of the last couple of weeks um, combined with the events of the last 400 years uh, have just been nothing short of devastating. Uh, my principal focus as the leader uh, of the organization really uh, has been to focus on my team uh, and to make sure that, uh, that they, every single staff person, especially the 500 African Americans feel loved and embraced and supported uh, and know that we have their back and will do everything that we can do internally and externally uh, to show that support and love uh, and commitment uh, and commitment to safety uh, and making sure that all of our, our clients, uh, many of whom live in very challenged neighborhoods, uh, also are and feel safe. Uh, but it's been an emotionally uh, very challenging time and I think that we have, uh, we have stepped up as an organization and stepped up together uh, acknowledging our privilege, our white privilege, acknowledging um, how much we have to do better uh, and uh, to be a leader both internally and externally. Um, it's, um, I'm proud of where we have come and what we're doing and, and so focused on making sure that the, the work that we do, uh, providing housing, providing health care, providing mental health care, keeping people out of jail, these are justice, uh, deeply justice-informed efforts um, that are um, that need to now be taken on steroids <laughs> uh, and put in the context of uh, of racial justice. Um, and so, uh, everything that we do at Thresholds is justice-oriented, and everything that we're going to do for going forward uh, will be. Uh, with even a more laser-focused racial justice uh, lens, if you will. Good. Thank you, Mark. Um, Todd, you already talked a, a little bit about um, this. You already spoke to this question a little bit when you described your short, medium, and long-term um, plans at, at Goose Island. I, if there's anything else you want to add here or even um, connect it to, to your response to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I want to give you that opportunity. Um, I know that um, the work you've been doing in industry has been, been really um, a real leadership spot for you. So go ahead and, and share with us if you have other thoughts to add to your, your comments. Sure. So I, I, it sounds like I jumped ahead on the question there uh, okay. last time. But, um, you know, the, the only th other comment I want to, and that's great, Mark. What Mark, what Mark had to say, it's great to, to hear that. And, um, it is devastating, uh, but you know when when I words matter now, and I challenged our employees to and all our employees to make sure we had an action plan uh, when we had a response and something that we could hold ourselves accountable to and and follow through on. Uh, and I think that's the important part: actually doing something and making a difference. Uh, so I, I will I will hold us to it, and and it's a ongoing, forever effort now. Um, and, and, you know, that's, 
I, I, I have full faith that, that we will be leaders in the industry. Uh, um, you know, with, with regards to COVID-19, I'll, I'll address that now. You know, we're, as an essential business, of, of course, our internally, our, our employees were, were scared, but I will tell you that breweries by nature are very uh, sanitary, um, probably more than any other business out there. Bacteria can destroy a beer, can infect a beer. Uh, but also we have a lot of safety procedures in place. Uh, breweries are very dangerous, a lot of hot pipes and, and acid and, and things that can injure you. So uh, how we adopted internally, we didn't have to do too much, uh, um, you know, temperature checks and such. Um, but, you know, part of, part of the DNA, I mentioned this earlier, of Goose Island, before we ever sold our first pint of beer, we were already working with the Erie Neighborhood House uh, back in 1988 uh, as part of our soft opening friends and family party, and we continue that relationship. So it really is part of, part of Goose Island's uh, ethos uh, to be part of the community, an important member and a contributing member. Uh, so when this happened, it wasn't uh, it wasn't what we would do in response to COVID nineteen, or, or if we would do something. It was how quickly and and uh, what the specific actions were. So we did quite a few things. Uh, you know, immediately we were donating meals from our pub, the Swedish Covenant Hospital. Uh, we put together a program, Chicago Cares, uh, with a bunch of pizza joints around the city, uh, beer and pizza deals for hospitality workers and we donated uh, from that to Meals on Wheels. Uh, and then we worked with the United Way. Uh, so to put together a beer called Sunshine Tomorrow Blonde. We talked about it a little bit earlier, but uh, uh, that beer sold out a lot faster than we expected. Uh, and you know, it was, it was nice to be able to, to help fund uh, the program that you put together, the uh, you know, Chicagoland Relief, uh, COVID Relief Fund. Uh, but I always say, uh, you know, what we can do is really raise awareness and, and draw people to that fund and, and to that. So I'm, I'm glad we had a small part of that. But, you know, beer, it, it takes us about 10, 10 to 14 days to make a beer. So we're able to pivot quickly uh, and, and make a beer specifically for, for a cause and to help raise awareness. So proud of the team and, uh, you know, proud, proud that you guys uh, partnered with us. And, and thanks for doing that. Thank you. Emma, let's, uh, let's, let's give you an opportunity here to, to address the, the current moment and, and the community response, what that's looked like for, for NBC5. You know, this, you know this, this year, of course, for everyone has been a, a, it's just a bit of a whirlwind of a year. And right now, the moment that we're in, our teams have been covering the story like professionals, like, like, like we always do. Um, but I think for, for us there, you know, on, on the back end there, there's been a lot of discussions within, within our, our newsrooms and within our, within our station about what does this mean internally and what does it mean, um, externally when we talk to our viewers. Um, I'm proud to say that our company has had many conversations that have come from the top down from the Comcast level down from the NBC, you and Telemundo side about this topic internally. So it's definitely uh, something that is part of who we are. But I think as far as what we feel is our place, like I mentioned before, we have our Making a Difference um, uh, initiative, but we really look at what we can do as journalists. And I'm not a journalist, but the team that is in the newsroom are journalists. And um, we've really leaned in on education because a lot of conversations that people are having and, and people are wanting to know more and, and really wanting to dig into this topic. And um, we're, we have really felt like this is a place where we can really help our viewers. If, if, if they want to know about you know, racial justice, about more about the African-American community and experience, the beautiful thing about Chicago is that we're so diverse. We have so many wonderful people here who can help us tell those stories, and that's what we're good at, storytelling. Um, and so that's, that's really where we really have pegged our focus. Even just last weekend, I, I sent a note to our, our VP of News on the NBC side and said, you know what, you know, when we talk about education, you know, Juneteenth is around the corner. That's an opportunity for us to talk about what is Juneteenth, because not everyone knows what it is for the African-American community, why it's so important. And so that's something you'll see coming up. And so those opportunities there and, you know, knowing the audience that is watching right now, and I talk about partnerships, I can't stress partnerships enough. 
um, as we move forward, and I know we're going to later on talk about long term, but as we move forward, those partnerships of businesses, of, of corporations, of, of nonprofits um, who are in this space, you know, let's work together because we together as a team can do so much. Um, and, and I'm so heartened by all the great things that are already happening and we want to tell those stories because we know we hear from our viewers that they want to be in this space and they want to help make Chicago and, and our country even better. Thanks, Emma. You know, I love that we talk about this as a moment, uh, but it's really a movement, right? This is, this is a moment because moments come and go and we have to turn this moment, which I think folks are doing, right, into a movement and, and turn these protests, which are fantastic, as long as people are masked and try to be six feet apart, right? Uh, but turning the protest into investment and turning the marches into money um, and making sure that we're you know, taking this movement to uh, reinvest in communities, to uh, explore how we're gonna turn our public safety system into a much more community-based um, and uh, community focused uh, safety system and, and how we're gonna take this moment to make a movement around criminal justice uh, so that poor black and brown people don't languish in jail. So I, I think it's, I, I like the word moment and it's a really amazing moment, uh, but to me it's really about the movement. Thank sorry you. about that. No, oh, no. <laughs> Just jumping in, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to uh, Todd touched on the the beer that he uh, produced. I really want to thank Roots Island for that because um, that kind of creativity is we're seeing that pop up throughout the city where um, people are doing what they can. And, and when you're the president and at a, of a brewing company and what you can do is make beer, that's that's what Roots Island did. Um, Sunshine tomato, tomorrow ale. Um, what I think is also interesting about it is how global this island is and that this was a very hyper-local effort. And I want you to, to talk about that decision and that toggling that goes on um, within the company as you look at your overall response and, and address and how you decide to focus in on, on Chicago and, and what the ultimate impact of that is. Sure. So, you know, we, we say it all the time. And, and like you said, we are now, you know, I still feel like we're the, the humble, you know, Clybourne Avenue brew pub that we started with 32 years ago. Uh, but we do have global distribution now. We have pubs all over the world. Um, and, you know, someone recently said to me, uh, you know, thank you for not letting Dick Wolf be the only uh, representative of Chicago around the world, the guy who makes Chicago fire and Chicago, all that. <laughs> right, so, we love Dick Wolf a, at NBC. <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't say it in a bad way. They just said, thank you for not being the only voice. Right? Um, but, but uh, you know, so we, we are 100% capacity in Chicago. We always say that Chicago inspires everything we do, uh, even globally. Uh, that the, the diversity of Chicago, the, the arts in Chicago, uh, just the attitude of Chicago, that goes into our beers and inspires us to make the beers we make. So in Chicago, our brewery is, is bursting at the seams. We, we can't make any more beer at our Chicago brewery. Uh, so when we do something hyper local like that, we have to sacrifice something that's already part of the plan, part, uh, something that was already in the plan. Um, and I, I like that I, I've given employees permission that they can, they feel comfortable enough to come forward when something like this arises to, to make a suggestion and I didn't even hesitate. The decision was about a three second decision. It was as quickly as I could say, yes, let's do it. Just find, find an organization that you really want to support. Um, so we, we cleared out one of the planned beers and uh, like I said, it takes 10, 10 to 14 days to make a beer, this specific beer and uh, we, we got after it immediately. So it wasn't, I wouldn't even say it was a decision. It, it was just, uh, who would who would come first from the brewing side with the idea? Uh, and one of our brewers, Pete Olson, did. And uh, like I said, it, our small small difference. We we do consider ourselves humble still. It's part of I think Chicago is is a humble city, um, despite the terminology of city of broad shoulders and stuff. So we uh, yeah yeah we it, 
it, it's not a hard decision, but it, it is an impactful decision. Good. Thanks, Todd. And I, I'm going to turn to you to talk a little bit more about um, how how NBC5 and Telemundo have, have adapted. Um, you said it yourself, what you're good at is storytelling and you know the media is covering rapidly evolving situations and the fast moving and far nature of, of both the COVID-19 crisis and the protests against racial inequality. I think um, even though you're, you're good at storytelling and this is what you do day in and day out, this is hard even for, for NBC. Can you tell us a little bit about how, um, because we, you know, I, I really want to probe on that idea of adapting and innovating. Like, how have you met the needs of your viewers here? What sorts of adaptations have you taken on? Yes, yes. You know, it's. I mean, everything is definitely moving fast, and you know, I've been I've been in media and television, I've been doing this for a long time, for you know, twenty plus years, and I I would say that the teams are usually used to moving quickly. You know, breaking news. We all know all those terms and all that. This, this situation right now, these first few months of 2020 have just been a blur. And there's been big story on top of big story on top of big story. Um, and they're more than stories. There's, these are things that are affecting people in some really deep ways. Um, adapting to what is what, what our viewers need. And I always kind of lean on that because that's really, really part of it is really listening to the viewers. And the beautiful thing of being a media is that we get immediate feedback. People will email, call, tweet, whatever. And so we, we, can, we know what's happened with what people are feeling. Um, and so from my seat in community outreach, you know, for example, at the very beginning when the COVID, when the, when the curve was really climbing, right, and the anxiety was through the roof, and I knew the anxiety was through the roof because I saw the, the emails and, 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 and the feedback from our viewers, um, leaned on those partnerships that we had with the faith community that we built over years with at NBC5 and Telemundo and, 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 and um, partnered with more than a dozen faith leaders and asked them, like, could you just send in on your, on your iPhone some words of comfort, some words to, to just soothe people, and let them know that we're gonna get through this together. And it was wonderful, they did that. And we're able to put that together in the spot and we were able to share that on our platforms. So when you talk about adapting, that's something that we had never really done before, something like that. But the fact that we could see that people needed some calm, it's like, well, let's see if we can maybe get some, 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 of, our, some of our partners to help us with that. Um, the, the fundraising, of course, um, helping United Way with a, with a giving campaign and, and some other organizations as well was, was something that was important to us um, because that, once again, listening to our viewers that we were overwhelmingly getting from the NBC side, what can we do to help? Because that was something that was, was coming in. And so we were happy to be able to do that. Um, what's interesting, you know, when we turn to the Telemundo side, we were hearing that from our Telemundo viewers as well, but there was a bit of a nuance with it, especially as the curve really hit hard in the Hispanic community. Um, and it kind of turned into, how do I get help? And that was really the overcome, overwhelming message that was coming in from the Telemundo side. So we adapted on that side. And a lot of times when you, when you have a, 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 what we call a duopoly in our, in our business, a duopoly station where it's NBC and Telemundo together, um, it's easy to make one thing and make it cookie cutter for both, both audiences. Um, but this was a situation where we needed to adapt and make it, make sure that our telling the audience was well served. And so we leaned once again on our community action board saying, what are the, what are the resources that are available for the Hispanic community that we can meet this particular time in this moment? And we got those in and we have put those up on our website. And so when you talk about adapting, those are the things that we're doing. When we look at the situation with the protests and, and all the conversations that are going on with um, racial, racial justice, um, just this week we had a live stream discussion with one of our anchors, Marion Brooks, with several leaders from our community, from our community to talk about what, is, what does this mean? How can we together make a difference at this time and move us forward in Chicago? And so adapting, once again, that was something kind of new for us. We had never really done something like that on live stream using, you know, methods sort of like this with Zoom and we actually use Microsoft Teams, but we were able to do it and get the message out there. You know, for us, you know, we're so used to trying to make everything look so perfect and, you know, with the graphics and all of that, but sometimes yeah. to get down and dirty and just get the message out there, right? And so that's, that's what we're doing and, and we're, we're so proud to be able to do that. Um, it, it's, it's a wonderful, I can't say that, it's not just 
us as a station, sometimes people see the Peacock and the Red Tea and say, oh, you look at that. But honestly, it's the partnerships, the Community Action Board, the business leaders that we work with, we all do it together. Emma, you know, it's, it's interesting to hear Todd and Mark speak from the, the perspective of a, a president or a CEO who can say yes to a beer very quickly because he's the president. <laughs> But it's good to hear you from from your spot where you're where you're situated in that that company um, being able to to say yes and go and take those risks to adapt and innovate in, in a very um, in a way that comes with some risk but ultimately um, take it like you said you just got to go it can't be free. go <laughs> I like that um, Mark uh, I know you said when you introduced threshold that. You, um, you work in in communities where they're at a high risk for COVID-19, and, and we've heard um, Emma talk a lot about how important partnerships are. I want to ask if um, you can talk about your partnership relationships and how you're leveraging and, and engaged with partners to, to meet the needs that are, um, that are part of your efforts and how that's helping. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I think thresholds, I mean, I, I've got to be a little careful here, but I think our response to COVID has been pretty phenomenal. Uh, so I got to first give all the credit to my staff and my clients, uh, who I believe are among the most resilient people in the world. Uh, at a time when there should be so much fear and so much anxiety, uh, my team and, and our clients, they just stepped up. And I think the results are seen in the numbers of people who have remained healthy and housed. And so, uh, so it's all about my team. Um, and it's really all about partnership. Uh, we would not be able to be doing what we are doing right now. So I think relatively successfully uh, without amazing partnerships at every level. And, um, you know, I have to first give a shout out to the state and the city, uh, the governor and the mayor's leadership on COVID, all things COVID-19 has been from my perspective, nothing short of phenomenal. When we thought we were going to have to close down in March or April, the state stepped up and said, we're going to make you whole. We're going to make sure that our grants through the Department of Human Services continue to flow. Do not let people go. We need you now more than ever. Uh, the city stepped up. Uh, when we needed PPE, uh, CDPH, the Chicago Department of Public Health, they were there. When we needed to expand our outreach teams, um, the city stepped up and provided us money to do just that. Uh, so the city and state, phenomenal. And this thing called the Chicago COVID Response Fund that the United Way knows a little bit about, um, I mean, talk about a, a lifeline, uh, a lifesaver. What you have done for Thresholds, uh, together with the Chicago Community Trust and all of your donors, many of whom I hope are on the phone today, uh, really nothing short of miraculous. Uh, and between you and so many others, we've raised almost a million dollars for emergency COVID response uh, that we've put to good use to keep people alive. And the numbers bear out that those dollars that you invested in us made a difference uh, and allowed us to do things that we wouldn't be able to do. For many of our staff, uh, we, we gave, um, we don't call it hazard pay because that's such a negative word, but a differential pay. Uh, for staff really on the front lines. We didn't know where the money was gonna come to make this differential pay for frontline and residential workers, but we did it. And we're in the midst of still continuing in it thanks to the COVID response fund. But our community partners, Howard Brown Health, they rented a van or bought a van so they could get their nurses out to our clients who we could not get to, so they could give them injections. Uh, Heartland Health Center, another FQHC partner, when we needed testing and our clients needed testing and our staff needed testing, they stepped up to make sure that we were getting tested. Um, we're, we're in the middle of a food crisis and a hunger crisis right now caused in part by COVID. Um, and Lakeview Pantry and Carol Lavin of the Lavin Fund stepped up so that we could provide thousands of meals to people that we serve that would otherwise go hungry. Tom Tunney today from Ann Sathers is delivering, I think himself, 50 meals uh, to our residents on the north side at noon that I wish I could be at, but I can't be at. Uh, Block Steel stepped up with PPE. Uh, Blick Art Studio Supplies made sure that we had art supplies so that our 
um, clients in art therapy who we can't see, but we could deliver supplies so they continue their recovery uh, with art supplies. I mean, I have to stop because I could just keep going on. The partnership response to this crisis has been so deep and so profound that I don't believe those relationships are gonna go away. Will all this money through COVID response fund go away? Yes, it has to go away. Um, but we've developed relationships institutionally and with people and with families uh, that I think are gonna transform the way that we do our work. And, um, and I really hope that these partnerships that we develop are sustained and expanded as we together uh, march down the movement uh, that is gonna be healthcare justice and racial justice in this city and in this country. Uh, the only way we can solve problems uh, and get good outcomes is through partnership. And I am, I'm just so humbled and so delighted um, that you all have stepped up um, in ways that I never, I never dreamed imaginable. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. That's, I, I know you could keep going with your partnerships. I, I, I said you, <laughs> I know, I you have to cut stop because you have to, but <laughs> it's so, um, even as uh, a, a staff person at United Way to hear the, the, how that connects in community and in the neighborhoods is really, um, it's important. It, it makes it real and really brings it to life. So thank you. Um, thank you. I'm going to, I have uh, a couple more, one more question for, for all of our panelists, but um, I want to make sure that we get to your questions. And if you have been thinking of things, um, please put them into the chat so that um, when we turn this over to, to some Q&A and all of you have an opportunity to participate, we can take your questions. Um, the next thing I want to ask everyone to, to talk about and, and Todd, we may come to you first on this, but as we're, um, we're looking at what we know is distinctive about the COVID-19 pandemic is how long-term its impacts are and that the, the process to recover from the crisis is it's not, it's not weeks or even months. We're, we're talking about a very long-term process here. And I wanna, as we think about that time horizon, I wanna ask you to talk a little bit about how you can take what you've learned from the crisis so far and and really um, maintain that that innovation and adaptability and and be continue to be as agile as you've been in the last few months since since we all started changing how we live and work so Todd can you talk about that a little bit for us sure so you know the the beer landscape is always changing and evolving. So we're, we're used to being nimble, um, but, but I think this has put us in a different place as far as our, our community engagement, where we can be more nimble um, in who we engage with, like Mark said, all these partnerships and who we partner with. Uh, we, we, we love our long-term relationships and we'll always keep them, but you know, we, we, can't, uh, we can't get complacent with with what's going on around us and, and need to adapt with that. But as far as what we make and, and how we talk to, to our consumers, we've, we've always been nimble. I think we could just apply that to a, a different aspect of the business. And you know, as far as how, how long-term this goes, you know, directly addressing COVID-19, uh, being part of a larger organization in Anheuser-Busch, we, we actually make beer in, in Wuhan uh, at a brewery there. So we've, We've, uh, we've been fortunate to, to be a little bit ahead of the curve in, in learnings and um, you know, how to adapt. And we've applied that to our business here even, even before uh, anything was shutting down. So um, you know, looking forward, I, I think you know, we'll continue to, to look to the world to help inform us if, if there's a second wave or, or what have you on how, uh, how we address that and how we adapt. So I, I think, um, you know, at, Adaptabil adaptability and nimbleness are, are something that every business needs to get used to and, and start applying. Thanks, Todd. Um, Emma, do you want to talk about what you, you've done to adapt and learned and what keep doing? <laughs> Not just do it in the moment, but keep it, keep it with you during this long-term recovery we're about to enter into? Yes, you know, being agile and nimble, as I mentioned before, that's something that we pride ourselves in, in what we do. But I don't think 
we realized how, <laughs> how, how much we could do that, how far we could take that. And I think what we've learned from this is that we are capable of doing more than we thought. We thought we were doing enough, we weren't. There's more we can do with either of the situations that are going on, with, with COVID, with racial justice. Um, and so I think we have been challenged internally. In fact, this week we're having um, more discussions internally at our stations about this and putting together our long-term plan um, regarding both of these issues. Um, and so I'm really excited to see where we go. Um, as far as the external, as far as what our viewers see, um, the storytelling is where I always come back to. It's, it's our bread and butter, it's what we do, and it's, it's very effective in getting the word out about how the disparities in different communities affect, affect them. And um, I, I, I'm looking forward to how we're gonna take that even deeper and further. And, um, you know, using more of our platforms, because I think a lot of times we do depend a lot on the on, on the television, which is great, and that we have millions of viewers on, on TV, but we've learned a lot about the power of live streaming, the power of other things, and the other ways to reach different types of people. Um, and so using all of that, all that we've learned is no doubt that we will be better. And I'm, I'm very excited about that. And this is not gonna be, once again, alone. This is gonna be with everyone um, the, the existing partners that we've had and the new ones that we have come into the fold because of the situation of right now. Mark. Yeah, I totally agree with both of my esteemed uh, co-presenters here. Uh, I think our agility and flexibility uh, and um, innovation over the last 60 years is what has brought us to this moment. I, uh, I think it made us poised to meet the moment and, uh, and the movement. It's also so obvious that COVID and, um, and George Floyd's murder and all the murders before George Floyd uh, exposed uh, sort of everything that is wrong uh, with our healthcare and justice system uh, and also unleashed the giants in us. Uh, and we're not going back. Uh, we're, we're learning from this. Uh, we're going to demand changes, uh, demand the way uh, we're paid, uh, demand uh, differences in the way rules and regulations and systems uh, support or don't support our clients to uh, healthy outcomes, uh, justice outcomes, and more. So, um, so yeah, I am, um, I'm excited about the future. I think uh, the past is going to propel us to that. And and the moments that we're in now, uh, we can't sort of shut the book, right? We can't shut the cover and say, okay, we read that book, we read that chapter. Uh, not at all. This is, uh, this is our collective moment uh, to really get uh, health and, uh, and social justice um, at the forefront. That, and we have to figure out next week how we're gonna more broadly reopen our businesses, right? <laughs> how we're gonna get people in elevators uh, where they feel safe coming up to the 14th floor, how we're gonna get people into people's houses. Uh, so we have this huge movement that we have to bring to life. And at the same time, we have to deal with uh, the real fears and anxieties uh, that people have uh, caused by both COVID and racial injustice. Can they get to work safely? Are they safe mm -hmm. even sleeping in their neighborhood? Are they going to be safe when they get on that elevator and share a bathroom? So, um, so we're this is this is a long haul. So what I tell everybody is try to get a good night's sleep because we are in this for a long, long time, and this is not for the faint of heart. We all got to put on our our big boy and big girl, uh, I guess, shorts and t-shirts. We're in the summer uh, and gear up, uh, and then put on our sweaters on the fall and our. Uh, our uh, other gear in the winter and then do it all over again so but i'm I, i'm i'm ready but that's because i try to get seven hours of sleep <laughs> i love that i love the part i um i i want to go to audience questions next i think um the the learnings of the last few weeks, you know, we, we've talked at United Way about what do we want to stop doing, what do we want to start doing, what do we want to continue doing, and those asking those three simple questions has been so helpful as we think about 
um, sustaining our energy and resources for the long haul. And it's really, um, it's a helpful focus to, to have stretched to, and to have learned that we can do things differently. Um, we, we never want to be in that, that comfort zone of saying that uh, we've done it, we're doing it this way because we've always done it this way. That, that, that reason isn't, isn't enough right now. Right. We have to, um, to continue to, to hold each other accountable. And so as partners of United Way, I thank all of you for, for your partnerships. And, and now I want to go, um, my colleague, Yara Goodwin has, um, has offered to help with uh, going through the Q&A. Some have submitted in the group chat, some have submitted individually, but I'm gonna turn to her so that she can pose these questions um, to our panelists. Thanks, Yara. Sure, so we just have um, a few moments here. So um, I'm just gonna select a couple of questions for us. The first one is for you, Emma. Um, you know, NBC5 and Telemundo have to balance a lot right now with reporting on the issues and as you talked about, um, making space for some of those community stories. So this question is around how do you, how do you balance that storytelling and um, encouraging with reporting on, you know, the, the tough things around these issues as well as reporting on other things that are happening because you know, there is other news to report. How do, how do you balance all of that? Right, wow. Well, <laughs> that is a tough one. Great you know, so, <laughs> well, so I'll tell you a, a little bit about, and some of you may already know this, so every day, I think what, twice a day, there's a big meeting in the morning, and that's exactly what they have to do with that meeting, right? Because there's only so much time that we have. We have a finite amount of time in order to tell an endless amount of stories. and it's it's a difficult it, it's it's difficult to, to to figure that out some things are pretty obvious you know you have the certain things that are going to always rise to the top and be the top news stories but then you have the rest of the newscast to try to fill out um i think it's a combination of once again listening to the viewers what are people needing to what are people needing at that moment um and honestly when you talk about diversity um it's having a diverse newsroom is a key because what somebody might think is the most important story from where they come from and their background might be different from somebody else from another part of town who may see things. And so having that diverse newsroom and giving everyone the power to speak up, we do a lot of that. And so we have a lot of healthy discussions to try to figure that out. Um, to talk about the, the difference between the, the, the top stories of the day, you know, is that, that we always know the mayor did this or the crime, corruption, all those type of stuff, um, and, and the more inspirational side of things. That's where that making a difference initiative that we started um, about six years ago really comes into play. When we brought that to the table, that was something that we said, okay, we are definitely here to inform our viewers, but also to inspire them as well. And so the way I look at what I do is as I see stories that tend to have a theme in our top, top of our newscasts, I try to make sure I lean on the other side of the house to say, what are some of the solutions? So we're not just providing, here are all the problems happening in the Chicago area, we also need to provide solutions as well. And so we actually internally will watch our newscasts and we'll look at it and see, did we balance? Is there an emotional balance here? Are we, are we looking, are we just telling you everything that's bad and oh, have a nice day? No, we wanna make sure that we're, we're shining the light on those unsung heroes um, and you walk away saying, okay, Chicago is a great place because quite honestly, there's more good that happened in Chicago than bad today. So that's the way we look at it. That's so fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so in our final moments here, I'm going to pick this question that I think all of you can probably answer and um, have different perspectives, but you all are um, kind of faced with COVID in different ways. And you've inspired all of us today by sharing how your organizations have made change to uh, support the community. So what things are inspiring you? And I guess we could start with you, Todd. So, you know, just the other panelists right here are inspiring me today. I think um, every day we're, we're seeing people come together, learning about new organizations, seeing the support to everyone. So, you know, right back to what we said, why we're proud of Chicago. Um, the amount of support I've seen from people and from organizations has just been 
phenomenal. So uh, hopefully we, we continue that um, and, and that that will always be an inspiration for us. So, so yeah, the, the support from the community has been amazing. Great. Mark? Sure. Uh, yeah, so just, I don't know, the world inspires me despite uh, the darkness and despite tragedy. I, uh, I wake up every day just feeling um, some days sad, some days really angry, uh, but just always so filled with hope about what we individually and collectively do, can do to make ourselves and our neighborhoods and our cities and our world a better place. Um, you know, I've been inspired, uh, though, through this crisis and for much of my adult life uh, by a quote. Um, so I talk a lot about love, but I also talk about power. And so for me, my inspiration is love and power. Um, some of you may know that Martin Luther King famously talked about love and power uh, 50 years ago. And uh, he says that power without love is reckless and abusive, but love without power is sentimental and anemic. And power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, which are so important today. And justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands in the way of love. Uh, so my inspiration is love, justice, and power. Thank you. Emma? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm so inspired, honestly, by all of you, quite honest. Um, I feel so honored to be in the position where I could get to, to see and hear all the great things that our community is doing together. Um, and being able to funnel that over to the newsroom so even more people can know about it. And so that honestly is what inspires me. Um, and I just want to encourage all of you to keep going. I know it's tough sometimes. I know it's really hard right now, but we have each other and we're, we're going to get through this and it's, it, and it's gonna, we're going to make Chicago an even better place. Um, and I'm, I'm also thankful for United Way for what you do. And I was actually thinking and, and just kind of meditating on the mantra of Live United. And just thinking about those words together, live united, what that means, especially for right now, for pick a crisis, any crisis, anything that's going on, how, how poignant that is for right now. And then also, you know, even those words separately, live and united. And I think that once you get that inside of you and, and can really feel that and, and do that, it's gonna get you through any, any situation. Um, I always say that, you know, in, in right now, if you think about the partnerships, a bad day, you may be having a bad day, but if you stop and think about it, it's gonna turn into a good day because you realize that there's so much good in the world and that's usually where I go, that's the place I go. It's like, yeah, it might be rough and you get stuck in the paperwork and the emails and all of that, but honestly, when you think about what we all get to do, it's really, it's, it's a wonderful day. Every day is a great day. Emma, thank you for ending us there. And thank you, Todd and Mark, um, all of our panelists and all of you for participating in this um, neighborhood exchange conversation. This was our first digital. We're always open to feedback at United Way of Metro <laughs> Chicago. So let us know if there are things we can do differently or better or address the needs that y'all are um, experiencing and feeling and, and thinking about in your companies and um, nonprofit organization and, and as individuals. So stay tuned for future events and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate you all. It was great. I made so many new friends on this page. I'm so <laughs> <laughs> And I love Goose Island beer. Not as much as my dad, but I love it. <laughs> there you go. Never too yeah. early. Thank you, Todd. Todd knows Have how it. much how, Todd knows how much we love it. I learned that it's a clean and dangerous place where you make it. I clean like and that. dangerous. Uh, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Have a great yeah. day, everyone. Have a great day. So much yes. love to all of you. Thanks, be everyone. safe, be mighty. Thank you. Thank you.